Now, if you're a parent, you'll know there's a tendency to overly brag about the things that your kids do, especially when they're little. You know, the first step's the most amazing thing. Or they, they do something that would be quite quite insignificant to others, but it's the absolute um, gold standard of childhood for you. And actually being a teacher just means that you have lots and lots and lots of children that you can brag about. And you think that your students are the best because of the things that they do. And there is such an abundance of talent amongst the young people of Teesdale that we have lots and lots to brag about. And even when the students have grown up and they're not young anymore, they were still your students and there's still something special about their accomplishments. I'm Simon Henderson, Head of Sixth Form and History at Teesdale School, and I am bursting with pride in this episode of Made in Teesdale. Made in Teesdale. And we actually sat there one night watching John Wayne's stage ghost film projected onto the wall. Wow. while looking down at the scene below. It, it is absolutely fascinating seeing inner city London children dropped into the middle of a working farm. I have very fond memories of growing up in Teesdale. I mean, living in the countryside and having, well, loads of fresh air, loads of space to play. It really is the case that if you come from County Durham, and, and in my case, have lived in southwest London for 40 years, but County Durham is still what I call home. When I mentioned to my colleagues who know who the guest for this episode is and who taught her, the overwhelming and unanimous response was to break out into a beaming smile and then share some sort of anecdote about teaching her or something that she might have said in the past. In today's episode of Made in Teesdale, I am interviewing Ruby Carrington, who left school in 2010, went on to Oxford to study medicine, and is now working in the Royal London Hospital. Hello, Ruby. How are you? Hi. I'm good, thank you. I'm, yeah, very good. So I, at this point in the podcast, I, I would normally say to my uh, guest, thanks very much for giving up your time. Um, that That is said with even greater sincerity and appreciation uh, for you today because I know that this is your day off from your day job um, which is working in the Royal London Hospital which is pretty hectic at the moment so I appreciate it hugely that you've taken some time to speak to us. Um, I wonder if you could start by just telling us a little bit about where you grew up in Teesdale and some childhood memories um, of back in the day. (laughs) Um, So I grew up in uh, Mickleton um, with my parents and my older brother, um, certainly in the middle of nowhere, no neighbours at all. Um, And I have very fond memories of growing up in Teesdale. Um, I mean, just in terms of our wonderful parents, which I'm sure they'd like me to say. um, Good plug in case they're listening. Yeah, um, I'm sure they will. Uh, I mean, living in the countryside and having, well, loads of fresh air, loads of space to play, all those kinds of things, I think I appreciate even more now I live in London. Um, And, yeah, I mean, great friends. And um, I think, I mean, things that most people think about in terms of living up in um, countryside I mean it was annoying not being able to um, drive and get places and having to have your parents take you places and all those kinds of things Um, but I mean in terms of the benefits they you know far outweighed any of those kind of negatives definitely. Any 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 memories of of Teesdale school um, your formative (laughs) years of education? Lots of memories of Teesdale School. Um, yeah, so I went there from, I don't know, it was probably about 2003, I think, to 2010. Um, and 
Yeah, no, I, I I really enjoyed my time at Teasdale. So I had really a really good friends from the start. I had I was in I don't know if anyone remembers Mr. Faulkner, but he was my form tutor. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, seven IF I remember. Um, and yeah, I, I just lots of um, lots of really supportive teachers. Um, and I did, um, uh, some, I mean, some of my favourites, you excluded, of course, Hendo, um, or included, but I, um, people who definitely had a massive impact on me would be Mrs. Farrah, who was a maths teacher, who um, just was incredibly supportive. And I still think about sometimes in terms of, um, you know, whenever I have to think about people who inspired me, because she was... Uh, just br- brilliant was brilliant at teaching the whole class and had made sure that everybody was included in, in everything and always supportive um and made a big difference yeah, yeah. um yeah and and uh, lots of I mean I one of my favorite subjects at school though it's not something I've sort of done professionally but uh, was art and I used to have uh, thoroughly enjoy all my art lessons and um Mrs. Thompson um, was always brilliant at um, giving me loads of opportunities in the art room. Um, and that's where I spent a lot of my days. With the wonderful views of the Dale as well from those windows up there. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I'd be covered literally in paint, paint coming out of my ears, kept everywhere. Um, but uh, no, it's great. And in my classroom, um, as we speak, I have the... Um, painting that you did of um barack obama i think circa 2008 <laughs> yeah. it's a little oil it's a little oil painting canvas um and it is on um it's on my wall pride of place in my classroom along with some other artwork and people point it out and go oh who did that and I said, that's ruby carrington and you've signed it so it's it's uh, it could be worth something in the future i'm holding on to it um, <laughs> just in case it's a very it's a very great piece of artwork and shows the um, multifaceted nature of your talents because you were great at art and great at maths and I seem to remember you were pretty darn good at history but I couldn't twist your arm into studying at A level you, you went all sciencey and mathsy um, because obviously you've gone on to study medicine so talk to me a little bit about um, where you went to study medicine and what that was like yeah um so I went to Oxford to study medicine um which was brilliant yeah I have only good things to say uh so I went to Pembroke College for my first three years so it's kind of the way that they do the medical course is um sort of I mean slightly old-fashioned as you might imagine but they do so you do lots of science-y based stuff in the first three years and then you do lots of clinically stuff in the in the second three years um but it worked that worked brilliantly because it means that you are at university with people and you're you know mixing with people doing all different subjects so you're not sort of just in the in the hospital all the time you, those first three years are a very sort of normal university experience where um just loads of having fun with your friends and working quite hard as well um and it I, I yeah I mean loads of I did lots and lots of sports stuff so I rowed a lot probably did more rowing than medicine in the first couple of years um and uh lots of squash uh had I mean went on ski trips did loads of loads of exciting stuff um and have lots of friends um who just uh, yeah have I, who are going to be you know friends for life uh, from those days and then second three years I was uh, st- still at Oxford I was in a different college called Green Templeton College which was um, where there's more grads and uh, lots of medics go there um, and spent lots of time in the hospital um, learning learning the trade which was uh, yeah I mean well I mean full of lots of different stories um, and uh, just a, a really good experience, really supportive tutors, um, lots of exposure to very interesting aspects of medicine. Um, and so much so, actually, I spent my, I did my, so when I qualified in 2016, so I became a doctor in 2016, and then I did my, you have to do a found, foundation years where you're working in all different specialties. Um, and I carried on in Oxford for another two years before moving moving out. So I was there for quite a long time. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so what 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 was the journey from you've graduated and you're a proper doctor um, to where you're working now? 
so after finishing my F2 year, I um, knew that I was, I sort of liked the kind of, uh, I guess, the adrenaline side of medicine um, and dealing with, you know, uh, sort of a really acute issues as a very sick patients um and that and I got lots of experience sort of doing taster days and you have to do kind of it's a bit like work work experience whilst you're at work uh doing anesthetics and ICU so um which essentially I mean I think when we think of anesthetics we think about just popping people to sleep for operations um which is definitely part of it but it's also the dealing with the most sick patients as well so it's, it's where you kind of take control of everything and sometimes that involves popping people to sleep so popping them into comas and popping them on popping them on ventilators and using different medications that you can't necessarily use in just on a normal ward um so I was definitely really interested in that and then I got a so after my first two years I was I did a junior clinical fellow post so kind of took a step out of training for a year which lots of people do um where I worked in um well actually I did nine months of working very hard and the rest traveling which was mm. a very nice Thing to do as well uh, but the, I worked yeah as a junior clinical fellow in, in intensive care um, and then I during that year applied to become uh, an anaesthetic trainee which is what you have to do the first bit which is what I'm just well I'm in the midst of now so that's a, a, a two years and then I'm I'm applying to be both an anaesthetic and an ICU registrar which is another five years till you become a consultant so it's 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 quite a long haul um so I've still got yeah so since since so when you get on the pathway it's still another seven years before you become a consultant but um so I'm in the middle of that now basically so so obviously your days at the moment are probably um taken up by issues with covid what yeah. what what's a typical day for you before covid in the hospital what sort of things would you be doing yeah, uh, so I mean, again, it very much depends on if I'm working in theatres or in intensive care, but I can sort of say a little bit about both. But in terms of in working in theatres, well, I mean, so yesterday, for for example, I was, I mean, a little bit influenced by COVID, but I wasn't in intensive care. But yesterday I was working in emergency theatres. Um, so essentially that involves, I go into the hospital for 7.45 and um, we then just, there's a handover from the night team and then they tell us about all the emergency operations that need to be done that day. Uh, which obviously chops and changes throughout the day as well. And the Royal London is the big trauma centre for London as well. So any the helicopters arrive and bring patients with limbs hanging off and things, they all come to us as well. Um, but so it starts. So it will start off with whatever they have um, got prepared for us. So that could be. I mean, yesterday we had. Um, so um, emergency um, obstetric operations, we had emergency, uh, which is like, so babies and things. And then we had um, a neurosurgical case. So somebody who needed to have a drain popped in their head. Um, and then we also had, so then it was slightly influenced by COVID because we had a patient who we put on something called ECMO, which is actually, it's a, a, an amazing thing they can do now. Where essentially they put a machine which acts for people's lungs. It's only worked for a very specific type of patient, but um, essentially going and getting this patient who had COVID and piping him into this machine that was then going to act as his lungs. Um, and then, I mean, that took up most of the most of the day transferring and doing all of those kind of things and then handing over to the to the night team um, and coming home. Well, and amongst all of that, there's actually a lot of camaraderie and, you know, there's lots of you at the moment. There's a lot of free food, which is very exciting for all of us. <laughs> generously donated. That's what keeps the NHS happy is free food and free coffee. So. You know, you talk about this stuff and you talk about it with incredible knowledge and a sort of a calm head and, you know, you, you're trained to do that. But one of the things that I always think of is how how do you deal with this emotionally? So when you come home at the end of the day and you're sitting in the four walls of your own house and, you know, you've, you've helped people to survive, but maybe you've not been able to help, how do you deal with that? How do you chill out? How do you relax? How do you sort of deal with with helping your own mental health 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's difficult and it's very, um, very relevant at the moment. I mean, you're reading it in the news, but it's definitely true. Lots of colleagues are having issues um, with, you know, sort of things from the first wave and then obviously it all coming back up again now. Um, and I think there's an element at which you become, you do become quite numb to it. And I don't, you know, it's diff- that's probably it's not always a good thing but it's kind of a necessary thing because otherwise you can't just you can't do your job every day um I think so the trust that I'm working at at the moment are very hot on this stuff and there's one of our consultants is brilliant and he runs I mean the whole well-being uh sort of program one of the things which she does is called coffee club um and coffee club doesn't actually always involve coffee but it involves um it's you know completely confidential everybody or tra- any trainees can go in or and consultants if they want and just talk about things so they just talk about cases that they've seen that day um and how they're feeling about things sometimes it's about training because obviously things are being messed up at the moment um you know it's just kind of an opportunity to chat and um to listen and you know i think people uh, sort of quite dubious about it some uh, initially but actually it's really helpful and you do find yourself wanting to talk about things that you didn't necessarily think you were going to when you yeah. when you went in um and so that's very helpful um and then I mean obviously um chatting about I've, chatting about things with my partner um and uh you know offloading to him a, a bit which he probably doesn't particularly enjoy but it's very helpful and actually he's not a medic so that helps as well I think it's useful yeah. to have some pers- perspective and realize that this is not what everybody everything that, um not everybody's going having the same experiences um and then you know exercise actually helps you know going for a run doing anything like that doing a bit of yoga or yeah. um and just watching telly and reading you know normal things as well it's really important I mean I've just had so along with all this other stuff goes exams which is a real pain um particularly at the moment because it's not what you've got headspace for so I've just kind of finished a set of exams and it's amazing how much even though that's very insignificant in the current climate the amount of weight that comes off your shoulders because it means that your off time isn't spent with your head in a textbook it's spent sitting in front of the tv and actually that makes a massive difference and i think that's i think that's that's hugely important you know obviously at this moment in time i think people are appreciating the work that nurses and doctors do even more than they normally do um that you know truly the things that that you are doing at the moment are and the word is used um intentionally are you know you are behaving in a heroic way at the moment but I think probably what people don't get is when you're a a junior doctor or you you, you're probably doing all of this stuff and you're still training and you're still doing exams and all of that extra stress on top of that it's incredible uh, the work that you do so we're obviously in a moment uh, nationally medically at the moment that um, we haven't seen in our lifetimes um, and we hear lots about it on the news. Um, as someone who's in the in the real eye of the storm, give us some hope of, for the way out of this. Why why are things going to be better with a sort of cold, rational medical hat on? Why will things be better in six, twelve, eighteen months time? Uh, I mean, I think as everybody said, vaccination is the key in this time. And that is why there is, although this wave now, the second wave is certainly as significant, if not more significant than the first wave, it would be very different if we didn't have these vaccines on the horizon and actually being, I mean, I've had my, um, I've had my first vaccine. um, And that, you know, that definitely does give us hope um, uh, that things are going to be better over the next, you know, coming months. And it is going to be months. With uh, Certainly the patients I'm seeing in intensive care now are going to be there for a few months. Um, but I think, yeah, the more people that we vaccinate, is that's going to make a, a, a massive difference. And I think it's, I mean, you know, thing, things can't, they're not... The having sort of a lockdown without any um, hope isn't a way to, to to go on. That's not it doesn't really work as a strategy. Whereas it does. Like I'm, you know, very much in favour of everything that's going on at the moment now because we have this potential outlet coming coming um, 
coming in the future. And I am, I am very hopeful. I mean, people in the hospitals are, are certainly hopeful as well. Um, you know, it's book your holidays maybe a bit later down the down the down the line, but they will come. They will come. Good stuff. Um, so, if obviously um, paling into ins- insignificance in many ways in comparison to what you're dealing with. Um, but uh, lots of our students are um, not in school at the moment. They are working from home and their parents are trying to manage that. Um, what what advice would you offer? If, if you were transported back in time and you were a secondary school student while this was going on, what advice do you think you would give yourselves to how to cope in the next few weeks and months with some remote learning? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things is that, like, I mean, I, I don't think it's in significant com really, because I think lots, you know, this is a really difficult time, and actually, I really sympathise with students. I think that's, um, I think one of the things that we have as doctors and actually recognise as a massive advantage is that we are going to work and seeing people, and so, you know, the first thing I'd say is that I think it's okay to feel rubbish about the situation if that makes sense it is yeah. a it is a rubbish situation and it is a massive thing that you know our parents have never experienced anything like this um and so it is a difficult time and I think we should kind of call it what it is you don't have to just carry on as you normally would that's it is going to be different um and I think in terms of what if I was if it was me I mean I think you've got to try and appreciate the things that you've got more of because of this lockdown. So in terms of spending time with your family, having a bit more time to read and do those kinds of things that you always feel you don't have time for. I mean, I know that's kind of, it's hard at the time, but later on you probably will appreciate that. You know, I certainly miss seeing my family and all those kinds of things. Um, And I think in terms of like just, um, remote learning I mean I think having structure to the day is probably a very boring thing to say but actually very um, important because it means that you have off time as well so if you actually schedule a time that you're going to get up and do this stuff and then a time where you're going to finish that means that when you finish you can actually you know do whatever you want from that point play video games watch tv don't have to just think oh I should be working all the time um yeah. Point. Very good point. You've mentioned your parents. Are, are they still up in Mickleton or are they in a different part of the world? Are they still where they were? Yeah, they're still in Mickleton. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure lockdown life has changed very much for them. Yeah. Um, my dad is on self lockdown anyway. Um, no, but they no, they're they're doing well and just spending lots of time uh, walking the dog. And uh, yeah. And pr- pre-pandemic, how often do you manage to get up here? Uh, so pre-pandemic well, as much I mean honestly as much as possible really um so whenever I've got I mean if I ever have like a chunk of time off like a week or something then I would definitely try and come home um so I mean it would normally be I guess uh, once every couple of months um but obviously not at the moment take the girl out of Teasdale but you can't take Teasdale out of the girl um you still miss the place Absolutely, yeah, and um, I miss my friends and many, well, a couple of my friends, um, Jill and Stace, they've both got babies now, and so I miss not seeing them. Um, I have to make do with with photos and things, Um, and I mean, I definitely miss all the fresh air and everything like that, absolutely. You you mentioned your sort of downtime and the importance of relaxing. Um, If if you were going to recommend a, a book to read for either parents and or students or a film to watch or an album to listen to what would your recommendation be for people in the possibly greater downtime we have at the moment well my I think my book recommendation I'm sorry is going to have to be incredibly unoriginal but um is Harry Potter because I don't if you have ne- well if you've read it or if you haven't read it it's just hours of joy and my little um, boys are mad on Harry Potter yeah I mean so I they were they right at the beginning of the first lockdown they released the first book audio book um on I audible or something for free and I end up like listening to it just commuting or whatever or doing the dishes and then and honestly I've carried on so I'm now at book seven so this is since the beginning of the lockdown 
and it's it's brought back everything that I used to love about it. So I'm afraid it's not. I mean, I'm sure that most people will have read it or whatever. But in terms of pure lockdown joy, I would say start Harry Potter again. I'm sure. Jake, I'm it. sure J.K. Rowling will be very appreciative of the. <laughs> Well, Ruby, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Um, we are we are always incredibly proud of our students. Um, our ex-students have left and gone off to do various different things. Um, I can honestly say, at the moment, we are all unbelievably proud of everything that you're doing. Every every member of staff who's still here, who remembers you and knows you, when I mentioned that I was going to speak to you today. They just broke out with a huge grin on their face um, because we all remember you so so fondly and we're so proud of what you're doing. Oh, thank you very much. Even during normal times, I think we we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the people who serve this country working in the NHS. Not just um, people like Ruby who's uh, working and actually frontline care but the the people who work in the hospitals behind the scenes who help to make everything work do an amazing job um and in the current climate in the current situation that the country faces they are truly heroic in the efforts that they are making if you uh, enjoyed that chat with ruby um, once we'd finished recording that interview we actually recorded a few other things, and you might find that Ruby um, pops up in a couple of other episodes in this podcast series later on. Until the next time, um, if you know somebody who you think has an interesting story uh, that would be good for this podcast, then please encourage them to get in touch. If you have an interesting story that you would like to share um, on this podcast, then please get in touch. Until the next episode, take care, stay safe, bye-bye.